Okay, can everybody hear me? Awesome. We may as well get started. So, welcome to Life on the Bleeding Edge, tracking new PHP versions. Thank you for coming. My name is Adam Harvey. I work on New Relic's PHP agent team. I contribute to PHP itself and the documentation and the website and pretty much every other Git repository that we have. Um, and I'm a really terrible cricket player. So that's, that's about all you need to know about me. I also have an accent, I apologise. So the talk's really about keeping up with new PHP versions because it's really only becoming more important to. Um, there are a number of reasons why you might want to keep up with recent PHP versions. The big one, of course, is for DrupalCon is that Drupal 8 is hopefully coming at some point soon-ish, and will require PHP 5.4.2 as a minimum version. So all of a sudden, I mean, Drupal historically has supported a lot, generally quite old PHP versions. They've done a good job of kind of maintaining forward and backward compatibility. Moving to PHP 5.4 has certainly given Drupal 8 the ability to rewrite lots of code. The code base looks a lot better. It's, you get to use traits and a lot of other new features. The trade-off, of course, though, is that now you have to actually have your development environments and your staging environments and your production environments all running recent versions of PHP. Of course, there are other reasons why you might want to have more recent versions of PHP as well. PHP 5.4 was quite a bit quicker than 5.3. PHP 5.5 bundles opcache, which allows you to do opcode caching and is bundled rather than having to pull APC in. It's also more stable than APC, which is a bonus. There are also, of course, new features in PHP, and, of course, you would also want to keep up with new versions for security fixes. Although, of course, in practice, a lot of those are dealt with by your, by your maintainer of the packages where you're, get, where you're getting PHP. So PHP recently, and I would go gesticulate at this normally, but I'm locked to the microphone. Um, PHP, norm, PHP has a three-year release cycle. So when a stable release comes out, it is fully supported for two years, and then it gets a third year of security fixes only, and then it's end of life. What this really means in practice is that to track, the, I guess, the current stable version of PHP, you're upgrading every year. In, in practice, you can upgrade every couple of years and maybe try and amortise the pain a little bit, but of course it's a bigger change at that point. So being aware of the dates for which support ends for PHP versions is can be fairly important. Um, PHP 5.3, for example, is about to have its complete end of life. It will no longer be getting security fixes whenever PHP 5.6 is released, which should be next month, if all goes according to plan. PHP 5.4 is about to enter security fix only mode. So it's an interesting one because if you run the minimum version of PHP that Drupal 8 supports when Drupal 8 is probably released next year, the PHP version will actually be very close to its end of life at that point. So there is an incentive to track newer versions like 5.5 or 5.6. And 5.6 is currently at beta 4 is coming out tomorrow. So it's, it's kind of getting to the point where you can play with it. As I said, distros usually backport security fixes into their official packages. That often only applies to security fixes, however. It, doesn't, it tends to be on a case-by-case -case basis for bug fixes, and it tends to really boil down to whatever the maintainer is having problems with will get backported. So you might want to actually not necessarily rely so heavily on the distribution packages, and I'll come back to that in a minute. As I said, there are also a bunch of new features in newer versions of PHP, some of which are actually pretty useful. Um, I mean, things like the password hashing API aren't so important for Drupal because you obviously have, code, have modules in Drupal that will handle those sorts of details. But things like generators, things like finally, um, in PHP 5.6 we have PHP DBG, which is um, um, an interactive debugger that will now be bundled with PHP. So that, that's a useful thing. There are many, there are many new features that are worth upgrading if you can. But of course the question then is, how do you do it? Well, there are kind of really two aspects to this. There's the question of how do I upgrade my servers, which is important, but there's also the question of how do I know what's in the new releases and what got broken in the new releases and what backward compatibility issues there are. 
So there are a bunch of ways you can keep track of that. We write um, a migration guide for every new version of PHP, so going from, say, 5.4 to 5.5. These are in the PHP manual. They're in the appendices, and they, will bre they break down every new feature, every backward compatibility break, every bit of changed functionality, new functions, engine changes. It goes into a lot of detail. So looking at one of those and skimming at least the first three or four pages, which will be new features, deprecated features, and backward compatibility breaks, is a really key part when you're upgrading. There are also news posts, there are blogs, you can come to talks at conferences. I know there have been a couple of talks this week on kind of newer versions of PHP. There's also, of course, the server side of it. So there are, I would say there are, well, there are obviously a number of ways you can get PHP, but the two main ones realistically are going to be packages, which are what I think most people do and what most people should do. You can also build from source, of course, and then there are other ways. Um, you have C, you know, you have control panels. So if you're on managed hosting, you might have something horrible like cPanel or, or uh, Virtual Min, which will give you a whole world of pain in and of itself, but will actually deal with one problem, which is keeping PHP up to date. So the package situation is a little bit mixed depending on what you're running. Um, if you're running CentOS or Red Hat, I'm very sorry. Um, if you're running Ubuntu or Debian, it's going to depend on what version you're running. The thing that struck me when I was putting this together, and I actually was doing this today to make sure I had up-to-date information, the thing that struck me was only half of these actually have new enough versions of PHP for Drupal 8. So, I mean, the theme of the week is Drupal 8 ready, as was said at the keynote yesterday. So, if you're looking to be Drupal 8 ready, Red Hat and Ubuntu 12.04 suddenly stop being very viable options. At least with the mainline packages. There are also unofficial packages available for Linux for the major Linux distributions. Both the Debian and Ubuntu and the CentOS and Red Hat ones that I've linked here. I will put the URL for the slides on Twitter and on the website after I'm done. These are actually maintained by the same people who maintain the distribution packages. So these are good ways to keep up to date with the current versions because you know they'll be packaged the same way as what you were installing in the first place. On macOS, uh, macOS itself actually ships with PHP 5.4, which is nice. Um, I was trying to find out today if 10.10 ships with 5.5. I haven't heard yet, but who knows. There is also Mac. I mean, I think for probably macOS in practice, we're really only looking at development environments here. I don't really know anyone who deploys production code onto macOS servers. Does anybody? I'm a lot of shaking my head. Okay, that's good to know. Um... But, I mean, you've got MAP, which is probably a good option for, for development environments. If you have Homebrew set up, which is awesome, uh, the Homebrew PHP repo includes every current PHP branch broken down with pretty much every Peckle package. So, for example, this is every PHP 5.5 package available in Homebrew. If it's not there, it just doesn't compile. I'm not going to talk about Windows. I really, really genuinely don't know what the state of the art there is. Um, I would I assume that something like XAMPP is going to be the best way to get going, but I think in practice, unless you're deploying onto a Windows environment, probably Azure, then it's hopefully fairly irrelevant. I mean, you're probably better off at that point using something like Vagrant to have a development environment. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. As I, mentioned, As I mentioned, another, another option is you can also build from source. From source. Um, um, this, is this is not quite as terrifying, as, terrifying as it sounds, but it's, it's probably, probably not, not the first thing you, thing you want to do with the command line. Um, um, it's a fairly, it's a fairly standard, standard compilation process for most, most Unix, Unix programs. programs. You, you basically, basically run a configure, configure script and you tell and you tell the options you run, you run make, and hopefully you get an executable out the other end. Configure dash, configure dash dash, dash help pretty much breaks, breaks, breaks down everything you would need to give up. The problem, problem is, is always getting the dependencies right. right. Now, Debian and Ubuntu, 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 Ubuntu cheese because you can use attached to just, just give you every build dependency for PHP packages. packages. And that will and that generally, generally you will give you enough to build. build. But you may, but you may want to, that will also install a lot of stuff you don't care about. So, building from source is doable, but it's just a little bit tricky. I mean, I would say if you can stick with packages, stick with packages. It's a good, way, it's a good to way to learn. It's a good way to, good way to help QA PHP, PHP itself. But, but or you're, you're interested in just, just kind of keeping up with a current 5.5 5, 5, 5, 5 version for your Drupal site to work on, it's probably, probably not, not worth the time. 
Nevertheless, Nevertheless this, this is, is the recipe we can get PHP and PM that will basically, basically support 7 and 8, and eight on, on PHP, PHP 5.5.5, Debian, Debian, and Ubuntu. You can say you it's not really that really hard, hard. hard. You just, the trick is getting, getting the library to be right. So knowing that you need the index and knowing that you need the index and knowing that you need the JPEG and so on and so forth. Finally, you may, you may, of course, need extensions such as Mac Cache, Cache, Cache on IPC, C, because you have to use AVC, AVC, you, you might want more. Oh, 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 there, 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 there are many reasons why you might want extension, 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 if there is a package, package you probably, probably have the extension already available. Package, package, use that, use that. If not, if not, you have you have the command line, command line tool. Which if you have, if you have a highlight element of element of environment set up, you can use package, package, and have it configured, configured. You can you download, download, download the package, package tarball and figure it yourself. Make it, make it, which works and is annoying. It's also it's worth also noting when you're, when you're rating, rating, particularly if you have to build out from outside. If you've actually, you've actually built your own packages, packages. PHP only you maintain, maintain binary, binary, binary build capability on a simple branch. So if you upgrade, so you upgrade PHP, PHP from 5.5.5, 5. 5. 5. 5. 5. you have to, have to, you have to, also, you have to also have to rebuild your extension. extension. That's the key point. You didn't install packages. If you install packages, if you install packages, 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 where are we going, are we going to the need, and how do those environments differ? Environment differ. So, 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 of course, all of us have these environments, environments completely isolated, development, testing, testing, production, we've never, never combined, combined any of them. Ideally, ideally you, want you want consistency between these environments. Um, um, you, know, you really, you really want, want to, to, as large as large degree as possible, on your development, your developers, workers, work in a similar environment, environment, much as much as same, the same environment, as a production, production environment, but not actually a production environment, because that goes very badly. On existing sites, you already have hosted. hosted. You're probably going to have to battle with a little bit. Um, um, there will, there will, you know, you hopefully be able to have staging, staging, staging server pretty much the same way, same way, testing, hopefully, hopefully, the same operating system. Operating system. Um, um, and you can use virtual machines, machines, machines to try and replicate your production environment for development. development. But you're probably never going to get exactly the same, particularly if you're just on the production environment where you just kind of build everything up over time. So you've got a VBS and you've just installed a bunch of packages and nobody really knows exactly what happens and password for my SQL database, nobody knows those. And I'm having a flashback to my design agency, sorry, I'm sorry. New sites are easier, 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 and use and use. There are so and many training so tools now for this sort of thing. They can use Vagrant and Docker, Docker, Docker to, to, to manage this. Manage this. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. You can manage your manage duration by using, by using tools like Chef, like Chef, Chef Hubble, Hubble, Ansible, and, and then you can actually build out, out a set of VMs that basically will be, be developed in developed and, and it will exactly match your testing environment and will exactly match your production environment. Provided, of course, you're using a VPS or dedicated hosting. Host. Of course, if you're using a managed managing solution, solution, and a lot of this lot becomes, of becomes somewhat, somewhat more difficult, but also less relevant, 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 relevant. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're using, you're using hosting, hosting through, through a company like, like Acquia, then, Acquia, then you, you're probably not going to be back there anymore. Exactly, exactly. So probably don't really want to. I mean, at that point, what you're really trying to manage is it works. The fact that PHP behaves differently on every platform. Because so much of PHP is being wrapped around the C standard library. So at that point, maybe what you really need to do is just at least match OSs or match Windows versus non-Windows at the very least. Vagrant may be your friend for this. So very quick digression. How many people know what Vagrant is before I go too far into this? Okay. So Vagrant so is, is, is obviously Vagrant, Vagrant um, um, basically is a way of manage, manage, defining and managing, managing virtual machines. machines. Um, it's um, usually used for development. development. You, you could build up virtual build up machines and deploy them to something like EC2 like if, if you really wanted, wanted to. to. But, but it's, it's really, really a great really development tool because it means that you can, say you've got a site that you're building for a Linux server and you've got a bug that is only appearing on the production server. And you think you've isolated it to being the environment. Something to do with file system handling on Linux or something like that. You, even if, if you're running, say, a, a Windows machine or a Mac like I am, you can use Vagrant to build up a virtual machine for whatever Linux distribution or Mac OS or a bunch of other operating systems if you're deploying, say, on Joint or Solaris at that point. Good luck. Um, so you can basically define how you want a virtual machine to be built, and then you can share that definition around, and it gives you an easy way of managing your virtual machine and managing development environments. 
Um, the website is vagrantart.com. I would strongly recommend at least browsing it, just from the point of view of it is a useful tool. So in terms of testing, so I mean we've dealt with the development environment, now moving on to testing. If you have the developer time and the spare hardware, um, which a lot of the time you don't, but if, if you do, it's great if you can, te it's, it's always nice to be able to set up your test suites, which of course again we all have, um, to run against newer PHP versions than the one you're actually deploying on. I mean obviously match your actual production environments as well. But it gives you an element of future proofing. Um, the last company I worked for before New Relic, we made uh, set top. We did entertainment systems, and we, we actually did software for set top boxes. And it was all managed by a actually it was a Symphony backend rather than a Drupal backend. Pretend I didn't say that. But it was a Symphony backend that we were running on PHP 5.4. Anyway, PHP 5.5 came out la uh, last year. It had lots of new hotness that we wanted to use. We were able to upgrade in basically an hour on our production environments because since about beta 2 of PHP 5.5, we'd, in, we'd had our continuous integration system actually doing tests on PHP 5.4, matching our production environment, but also PHP 5.5 for whatever the current version was. Now, I've got a little bit of self-interest in saying this as well, to declare my hand. I obviously work on PHP. We really need more bug reports from people on PHP 5.6 and in development versions. So it actually helps us as well, but it helps you because the time that you spend to start with making sure it runs on the new version and reporting any bugs where we broke your code and it was our fault, then means down the track that when it is time to upgrade, you're upgrading a service distro, you need to upgrade because the version of PHP you're on is about to become end of life, whatever the reason may be, you can then actually upgrade very, very rapidly and seamlessly. So I strongly recommend that if you have the ability to do it. And not everybody's going to, and that's fine. But if you do have, if you do have, particularly if you have dedicated QA people or if you have dedicated infrastructure people, this is a really good thing to do. There are a few ways you can get these multiple versions. You could, if you're building your own, you can prefix, you can give configure a prefix and it will install everything into that directory. So you could set up an opt hierarchy like that. You can have multiple VMs and if you're using something like Jenkins, then you can just have multiple build slaves in your job configuration. You can use Docker containers. So Docker is an interesting thing. It's basically a way of building a container that contains a Linux server but which doesn't run in a virtual machine. It runs on a Linux host in using containers, which are basically a somewhat similar to BSD jails or to Solaris zones in terms of you don't have the overhead of the virtualization. I mean, you can run this on a VPS and it's not a problem. But it still gives you a declarative way to have a consistent way of building out these containers and what you put in them and what PHP you put in them, for example. There are also hosting services now that are beginning to emerge for Docker containers. Um, it's still a relatively new thing, but what that means is that you can actually use, specify a Docker container, and then basically you know you've got the exact same environment from development all the way to production, all through those phases. The nice thing about Docker is, as I said, it's very declarative. So you can actually set this up very easily. So if you want to set up a PHP 5.4 Docker, you, I mean, this is obviously just for the command line, but you can extend this out to whatever set of packages you need. It's literally a three-line Docker file. You run a build command and you run a run command. And if that test.php is your top-level test suite, you've just run your tests on that version of PHP. And then if you want 5.5, I mean, in this case, all I've done is change which version of Debian we're pulling in, so it's a version that has 5.5, build, run. You just got test results on multiple versions of PHP for very, very little work. So moving into production, if you're on shared hosting, you probably can't control the version of PHP you have. It's probably old, and you probably really wish you were on a VPS already. So go to a VPS. I, I wouldn't... Ten years ago, shared hosting made sense. Hardware was more expensive. Hardware was more expensive. I don't really have a second point. Nowadays, it doesn't really make as much sense. VPS hosting is very cheap. If you don't have the in-house expertise to do VPS hosting or manage your own servers, there are many, many fully managed options. There's Acquia, there's Heroku, there's Google App, App Engine. There's so many ways to skin this particular cat. So 
you know, there's kind of, I would say if you've got the in-house expertise, go for a VPS or a dedicated host or multiple dedicated hosts, depending on your size. If you don't have the in-house expertise, there are plenty of companies who will very happily deal with this for you. My marketing department would like me to note that you should also install New Relic. So to summarise, new versions of PHP don't have to be scary, and you can get significant wins both immediately and down the track by tracking new versions of PHP and testing against new versions of PHP. There are so many new tools now, like Vagrant, like Docker. I mean, I've only just touched on these very briefly. This isn't a tutorial. But there are so many tools that allow you to have more environmental consistency and thereby hopefully reduce your bugs and reduce your testing overhead when you go from development into production for your awesome new Drupal 7 and 8 sites. That is all I have. I am happy to take questions, and thank you very much. Are there any questions? Well, thank you again. I believe the next speaker will be up in about eight minutes, ten seconds. Should I swap out my Stevens Path sticker with a form one sticker? <laughs> well, I mean. This is my favorite ski resort. 10% battery life is enough, right? No, I, I think it's what's up to this. Do you have the power? It's going to be all right. <laughs> no, I'm actually. my inbox. <laughs> It was just working. Yeah, I don't remember that. It's the little privacy control here. Yeah, you know. <laughs> just in case the tab didn't actually go through. <laughs> you're typing your password. <laughs> uh, was it Ned? Did you just set his drive window? Go back to drive. I'll show you slides get switched. Yep. Oh no, this, so this is the live one, so they already are switched. Okay. But I can actually go and delete my dupe. Delete my dupe. Delete. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yep. Present. Oh.
Welcome to 5.30 on Wednesday. <laughs> Welcome to 526 on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we, um, I don't know if folks are going to be flooding to this thing. So if um, we do have a lot of slides, do you want to just get yeah, rolling? Yeah, let's go for it. And if, for folks, it. if folks uh, trickle in. Um, so this, uh, this business showcase is a story that we're going to tell about um, a city, Seattle, and, and the surrounding region, Puget Sound, and a bicycle club. Um, you typically would think a bicycle club is a little tiny organization. This happens to be one of the nation's biggest bicycle clubs. Um, it's the Cascade Bicycle Club. And um, how they, over the past year or so, um, have revamped the way in which they're operating their business uh, to use Drupal. They, um, like lots of organizations, their lifeblood really is their website. They organize um, Lots and lots of rides in the region um, have some 60,000 members um, and host some 95 races. And really, it's the registrations for those races and the communications with their members through the, the site that is uh, what drives the organization. So it's not just a it's not just a website. It really is their operational business tool. Um, and so this is a story about uh, how Drupal has has helped to, to um, for them to achieve that and sustain that that kind of operational need that they have, which is to run the business and serve their members. Um, I'm Kurt Velker. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Forum One, <clears throat> and I'm joined by Andy Heave and Andrew Morton. They were um, engineers on, on the project. Andy heads our West Coast um, tech folks. We have offices in Seattle and Washington, D.C., and Alexandria, Virginia. We're about 80 folks. Um, and Andrew is a senior developer on the project. Um, we should probably say also, we, we typically do this presentation with some folks from Cascade. Uh, they're not here today, and, and Andy's the active technical architect on the project, and um, Andrew is, is working on the project actively now. Um, both of them came in at, later in the project. Um, so just full disclosure there, some of the things that, that we're going to show you, they, they didn't work on directly in the early days. Um, and for those of you who don't know us, uh, Forum One is a full-service digital agency. Like I said, we're at headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia, and in, have offices in Seattle um, and some folks in the Bay Area. We're about 80 folks. We um, craft solutions for what we think of as really influential, important organizations that are focused on health, education, the environment. Um, kind of the world's problem solvers is what we like to think about. So we're, we're very mission-driven with the types of folks that we work with, uh, and we help them craft solutions to make them better at solving those problems. That's really our mission in life. Um, I hope that it's going to be an interesting conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew at this point so he can share the story. Cool. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, so I'm just going to give you a few more points about Cascade here. Uh, they are a cycling advocacy uh, organization, so they do a lot of lobbying. Uh, they go to a lot of um, meetings with uh, the local transpo groups to, um, you know, get more cycling lanes built. Uh, they're uh, actually the largest cycling club in the nation. Uh, Seattleites are very enthusiastic about their cycling, um, but they, they serve the Puget Sound region. Um, they've got over 2,000 ongoing daily rides. Those are organized by volunteers. They kind of assemble people and take them around the city um, and do everything uh, in between that, just from the fun stuff from, to the lobbying and advocacy. Um, they, they've been around for 40 years, and over those years, they've built out multiple websites and different web entities. Uh, but now they're kind of coming together, they're looking at what they have, and they're like, let's clean this up a bit. Let's turn this into one solid site that does what we need. Um, they have a long history in Seattle, uh, bouncing around to different vendors or even working with multiple vendors at once. Uh, but our partnership with them began in 2013. So yeah, that's the, kind of the background on Forum One and on Cascade. And so what did this project actually look like for us? Um, it was a big project. We had to uh, consolidate 12-ish websites, uh, eight of which were pretty static, four of which were dynamic database-driven uh, websites into one. Those dynamic sites were on platforms varying from ColdFusion to WordPress, some forum software. And their Drupal 6 instance, which was running Civi CRM and Ubercart. 
So we had to consolidate all those sites into one. We had to upgrade the main site, get uh, all of the software updated, all the various components for that. And as you can see, uh, the, the sites that they had previously were pretty dated. They needed some pretty substantial user interface and user experience work. So we had a, a substantial redesign task ahead of us as well. There were some technical challenges on the project. Uh, we're going to talk about three of them in particular today that help us tell this story. So there was a lot of techn technical debt on the project. Not uh, surprising given the history that Andrew mentioned. A lot of people had touched this over a long period of time. Uh, and they had essentially all of their business logic encapsulated in a bunch of custom code on the site. It was roughly 15 Drupal modules, uh, roughly 15,000 lines of code. Uh, the, again, not surprisingly, that code was not very well documented, very difficult to understand, uh, and it was spaghetti code, spaghetti code, basically. So it was uh, a lot of technical debt that we inherited. Uh, needless to say, maintaining those sites, given that situation, was a lot of work. Adding new features was a lot of work. And certainly a, a key goal of our project was to reduce those maintenance costs. So we had this grand vision originally to just rebuild the site from scratch. We had a chance to sit down with them. We're going to start from scratch, apply all those lessons learned. We're going to rebuild the site completely. Um, we're going to get rid of Ubercart. We're going to go with Drupal Commerce, uh, obviously go into Drupal 7. We're going to eliminate as much of that custom code as we possibly can and move it into contributed modules. Um, workhorses like rules we, fi we figured could do most of the work for us. Uh, and the custom code that we did need to keep around, we would refactor as best possible. We would clean up. Uh, and we would start with a brand spanking new bike instead of the old bike. Uh, but as we got into discovery, we realized that that was a gargantuan task. Uh, just to understand all of that business logic uh, uh, and then try to rewrite it completely from scratch was going to be a huge task that was going to exceed the scope of our work. I mean, we felt that due to staff turnover on the project over the years, that not only was all the custom, all the business logic captured in this custom code, but it was really the only record of this business logic. So uh, to try to rewrite that from scratch was going to exceed the scope of the project. So our approach instead was to upgrade the site, uh, to take all the various components, uh, Drupal, Civi, Ubercart, and upgrade them. We decided to stick with Ubercart as opposed to changing over to Drupal Commerce. And uh, that still gave us the advantages of uh, cleaning up the custom code as best we could, refactoring where it was possible, certainly documenting it better along the way. This was a big pivot for the project. Um, but thankfully, at this point, we already had a great relationship with Cascade. Uh, we were really a trusted partner of theirs. Uh, we talked with them about it. They understood the situation, and they trusted our recommendation. Oops. So some lessons we learned from that challenge. Upgrading can be less risky than uh, rebuilding the site uh, in, in cer certain situations. And again, we were able to still reap a lot of benefits of touching that custom code, uh, again, refactoring where possible, but certainly cleaning it up, better documenting, uh, and providing ourselves a much better platform moving forward to iteratively develop on top of. Uh, the coder module was also a lifesaver for us uh, as far as pointing out Drupal 6 to 7 API changes and syntax changes. Uh, we really relied on that for porting over the custom modules from 6 to 7. So. The second technical challenge we want to talk about was trying to upgrade and redesign at the same time. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what I mean by redesign in a minute. Uh, but it was a bit like juggling while trying to ride a bike. Uh, to stick with the bike analogies, not very easy to do. Um, so again, after we came out of Discovery, we decided to upgrade all the major technical components of the site, Drupal, Civi, Ubercart, uh, port over the custom modules. And at the same time, we were trying to do a substantial redesign of the site. We were going to uh, build it responsively. We were going to add a whole new suite of page layout options for their editorial staff. Um, 
what else? Add a bunch of new features. There's one other thing I was forgetting in there. Oh, entirely new information architecture, not unimportant. So we were redesigning the site and upgrading, and our plan was to do that at the same time. Uh, that's a lot of work. So here are some of the problems that we ran into with that approach. Uh, first of all, we found that a lot of the redesign decisions were dependent on the upgrade. So, for example, if we had decided to move to Drupal Commerce from Ubercart, we would have needed to redesign the whole order workflow for the end users as well as retrain the Cascade staff on store management from an editorial perspective. We also found that the tech team's attention was split between trying to really wrap our heads around the upgrade and work hard on the upgrade and at the same time talk to the Cascade staff, information architects, designers uh, about decisions related to the redesign. Uh, and like I said before, there was, there was enough unknowns in that business logic and the custom code that it was really difficult for us to uh, work with the team to estimate and prioritize redesign tasks that might come after the upgrade. So, what we decided to do was pause the redesign completely and just focus 100% uh, on the upgrade first. We called this our Uber Sprint. And the technical team essentially locked themselves in a room for a couple of weeks, just pounded out the upgrade, didn't even think about the redesign. This let us get the, the really the most critical part of the project behind us uh, and before we would move on, and the riskiest part of the project by far, before we would move on to the redesign steps. So, in retrospect, we might have even pushed this a bit further and split the project into two and really pushed the upgrade all the way out to production before we turned our attention to the redesign. Uh, that would have let us uh, take a less, it would have been a less risky approach for sure. Uh, as it was, the, to go through the full launch process was some 300 steps. Uh, many of those were manual. It, it took over eight hours. I think on launch day it was 14 was hours. 14. <laughs> it, was, it was a big process. So, and for that reason, we could only test it twice uh, from start to finish before, before launch. So that's, that's pretty risky. So if, if, we had split the, uh, pro if we had split that into two steps, it would have been less risky. It would have been definitely easier on the project team. Arguably, it could have taken a little bit more time uh, calendar-wise. It could have uh, been slightly more work as well, because we would have had to, for example, port the theme over. Um, but on the whole, we felt like that would have been a smarter approach. And then lastly, a uh, technical challenge I want to talk about was staging content. That's a great picture. Um, the Cascade editorial team had 100-ish new pieces of content they, they wanted to be able to edit and refine using their full editorial workflow, but have published uh, at launch, again, in the new design, in the new information architecture. Understandable. There was a lot of baggage laying around as far as their content uh, from over the years. So, but we had to figure out how to do that um, because in the dev and staging environments that we were working on, we were really hammering on the upgrade. Uh, they were pretty uh, unstable. We were pushing a lot of new code often, and we were testing the upgrade often. So, forget if I, yeah, what we ended up doing was actually spinning up a separate content staging server, and we provisioned that for the Cascade folks so they could actually build out all their new content there, all their new menu structure, everything in the new design, the new information architecture. Uh, and we are, in the meantime, pushing code out to the dev and staging environment and doing our testing there. And we created a system using Migrate and the Migrate Drupal to Drupal modules to periodically uh, migrate content from the content staging side into those other environments. Uh, because of how Migrate works, we could do that iteratively, we could do it often. It was a, a really nice solution to that problem. One, are, are there any developers in the room? Kind of, okay, I don't know if um, y'all have worked with Panelizer or Migrate before, but one quick tip here, uh, when we were doing the migration, uh, so the Cascade site relies on Panelizer quite a bit for per node panel and layout settings. Uh, when we were doing the migration, we found that um, Panelizer doesn't support Migrate. So we had to work around that a bit. Here's the solution we came up with. Um, there, was, <laughs> there was a little discussion with Mike Ryan about whether this DB set active was a smart thing to do, but. Basically, what we're doing is 
we needed an extra step of uh, extracting the panelizer settings for the given node from the source database and then later injecting them into the new entity on the destination database. Cool, so we just went over a couple of the technical challenges, but I want to call out some of the big wins we had. Uh, uh, mo mostly uh, with, well not mostly, but one of the, th the items is our content layout options. We were able to provide their editors. Uh, because we were bringing in so many uh, different sites into this one, um, we were, we're now responsible for uh, serving a wider audience um, and you know hosting more content. Um, so just to recap on where we're coming from, uh, their design was a little bit dated, and they also wanted to go to a uh, mobile responsive layout, uh, as most of their members are, in fact, mobile. Uh, this is just a cross-section of some of their content. Um, on the left side there, you can see how deep their menu goes. Um, this page shows a gallery of uh, some of their major rides throughout the year. Um, it was just a really great way to um, show this all up front to some of their their users and uh, entice them to click through and find out more. Uh, and here's an example of clicking through to one of those major rides. Um, you can see here in red on the left side how many uh, additional pages deeper in the hierarchy we have, providing just tons of information about this one particular ride. Um, and this is the Seattle to Portland bike ride, which we participated in, which was pretty fun. Uh, and a quick recipe here. Um, this is a solution that we use a lot. Um, panels, panelizer, fuelable panel panes, and um, oh, uh, menu block. Uh, really does a great job of putting this all out there, and it's pretty quick and easy to build. But now I want to talk about performance. So uh, the, the website's really important to Cascade's organization. 80% uh, of their revenue comes through this website, uh, and most of that comes through um, during two high-peak sale, uh, sales periods in January and February, where they open up uh, in two stages, uh, event purchases for the whole year. Uh, and so what happens, you have all these enthusiastic cyclists who are just lining up to participate. They know the rides sell out, um, and most of them are trying to compete to get like low numbers on their bibs for some reason. <laughs> um, but long story short, uh, they knew that this had to work when we launched it. Um, so this shows you what those traffic spikes look like. Uh, I know this says visits, but that's actually concurrent users, and this is transactional data. This isn't just browsing uh, static content. Um, so yeah, the orders of magnitude difference. Uh, we started off tackling this pro problem uh, by ramping, ramping up to the largest single instance on AWS. It's a C3 8XL. Uh, it's, it's massive. It's got 30 cores, 60 gigs of RAM, and runs on solid state drives. Uh, it was really kind of fun just to log into that thing. <laughs> um, but uh, we went even further. We did some testing. We used a tool called Load Impact that allowed us to script a scenario through the site. So I basically clicked through to the, um, the purchase workflow. And then it uses that uh, scenario to script multiple concurrent runs through that. And we were able to ramp that up and kind of find out where different parts of the server topple over. Uh, and tune those until we've got it optimized to the best we can. Um, so some lessons we learned along the way there. Uh, start early. You'll need time to make improvements. Um, we launched the site in November, and their high peak traffic period was in January. So we had about two months uh, that gave us enough time to get through all these, this testing and uh, optimize. Um, not that we spent a full two months. Uh, we, there was a lot of debate over what they wanted to do here. Um, when you do upgrades, don't just assume that's going to give you a performance boost. Uh, as we found out with our uh, additional uh, uh, theming layer and um, you know additional features in the CVCRM platform and the Ubercart platform, I think Drupal may have gotten faster. Um, yeah, uh, didn't didn't uh, you know? We still had to do this testing and optimization. Um, but the real key here is knowing what your target is and being able to question uh, if your test is matching your target. Um, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, the website has this many concurrent users, therefore the test needs to support this many concurrent users. 
the test is a simulation. It is not always represent real life performance. Um, and you can do this by you know having multiple tests and also tracking your performance in your um, your analytics numbers. Uh, and to bring you back to the title here, uh, riding tandem, um, we really work closely with uh, Cascade. Um, there was a number of staff turnovers on their side, which really led to some challenges. But because we worked so closely with them and we kind of c carried on the documentation of what we were building for them, uh, we were able to help them out with their staff transitions, kind of bring some of their people up to speed, especially their communications people. Uh, and just to point out, their executive director was transitioned um, during this build. So you can imagine a new ED coming in during a project and just being like, What's going on here? But she was she was very uh, good about um, you know letting us do our thing, which is just amazing. Uh, pro tip here: uh, do some co-location with them. Uh, we biked over to their office about twice a week and uh, just kind of sat alongside them. Uh, it really made it a lot easier as we're going through this uh, six to seven upgrade code. Basically, what happens is you start off, nothing works. And so as you're looking at the code and trying to make it work, you're like, OK, what is this supposed to do? And so having them right there to tell us what they wanted to do with it uh, really helped get through that a lot faster. Um, and just to kind of point out, uh, this is a picture of launch day. Um, and we're all sitting here. We've got content people. We've got QA, also the person who does the business logic. Um, we've got PMs, developers, themers. Uh, and tech leads, both uh, internal and external. Um, another tip, uh, check out a shared chat room program. Uh, this is HipChat. Uh, it was really easy to uh, get them in and respond to our questions really quickly. Uh, one key thing here is uh, their uh, tech lead, uh, his name is Tim O'Connor, um, he kind of uh, Uh, wrangled a lot of uh, their requests on their side so that we weren't getting just shotgunned with requests. Um, we were able to decisively uh, go through what they wanted and make sure we were doing it at a rate that we could achieve. Uh, another item, uh, so we had this feature for daily rides. Um, and when we originally scoped it out, we thought it would be easy. But once we got through discovery, we realized that what they wanted was much bigger than what we thought we would get. Uh, so we worked with uh, someone on their team, Alan, who um, he did a lot of their reporting. So he did a lot of database queries um, and was familiar with uh, certain aspects of their system uh, and wanted to learn more. Uh, and this was a great opportunity for us to um, teach them a little bit about Drupal. You know. Uh, when you don't know what a system can do, it's hard to know what to ask for. But uh, getting him in, uh, and he actually came down to our office and worked alongside us. We coached him into building out this daily rides feature. And that was a pretty big success. Uh, one more, uh, get out in the field. So this is us on the Saddle to Portland bike ride. Um, got our sweet Forum 1 jerseys. All happy to be there. It's a little early for me. I'm a little less happy. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so so uh, the relationship was excellent. The partnership is excellent. That's really the story we want to tell. But we want to circle back to you on, um, to demonstrate that on what did we actually achieve here. Um, so again, they had a uh, pretty disparate and uh, dated set of scattered web properties in the beginning didn't really serve their uh, audience or their business needs very well. Uh, and we brought that together into one unified Drupal 7 platform. Uh, they have a platform to sanely continue development forward now as well. Um, it's all redesigned. Uh, it supports their full editorial workflow and redesigned in, in a responsive way as well. Uh, and the site was received really well by uh, not only Cascade and their stakeholders, but the entire Puget Sound uh, bicycling community. This is a tweet that we enjoyed uh, from Seattle Bike Blog, which isn't connected to them. It's fancy, and you can find stuff. It's great. 
and crucially uh, the site has stood up to support this this uh, mission critical revenue stream for them again 80% of their revenue through the website most of that in, in two days basically uh, and it, it stood up for them uh, at the peak there were a thousand plus simultaneous users they ran through 156 orders in six minutes I guess that was the tops there but um, uh, the site Andrew mentioned there's a long history in the tech community. There there had been problems on these days, as you would expect, and the site held up for them. So that was absolutely crucial. And ultimately, uh, it's the site's just given them, uh, this platform's given them a uh, better way to engage with the uh, audience groups that they want to educate, support, and advocate for. That's all we've got. Questions? Any, any questions? Does anybody in here ride a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Yeah, uh, oh, panels uh, and hold on, hold on. We were going to repeat the question politely. The uh, question was about the, the list of modules used for the page layout options that we were discussing. Yeah, that was uh, panels, panelizer, menu block, and fieldable panels panes. Also check out the pain module. It's written by uh, one of the four and one guys. Um, it, what's really cool about it is it um, lets you capture the container and your content into features separately. You can, can, you can capture one or the other or both, which can be really handy. So you could like deploy the container, stick the content in, and then if they change the content, it doesn't tell you that features is overridden. Yeah. <laughs> well, we touched on some of it, uh, and Andrew, you can jump in here as well, but it, it took a long time. That was like the heart of the project, really. It was really difficult. You know, and as developers, we're kind of like, you know, give us the code. Let's see what's going on. We'll figure it out. Um, and like I mentioned, that was very difficult. Uh, but But really, it was that partnership that had to facilitate it. We had to get to know them really well. When we co-located, that was priceless because we could just bounce questions off of them right away. Um, but yeah, there, w there wasn't an easy answer to that. Well, actually, um, so uh, our former tech lead went into their office and got to sit down with them, uh, sat with each one and sort of walked through uh, how they were using the platform. The thing that we missed uh, that it, it, was, it was hard to get um, was, um, all the logic that was in the code that they just don't tell you when you're sitting with them. So uh, most of that came down when we were in the Uber Sprint, and we were going through this code and just like, what is this supposed to do? Uh, sometimes it would be obvious, and sometimes it was just like really bad convoluted code that we had inherited. And um, uh, so we really needed to like, be able to ping them really quickly and find out, like, what do you, what do you want here? Uh, and of course, document along the way. Anything else? <laughs> sure. It's a good slide, right? Yeah, I'll send it to you, Bench. It's in there. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody.